for this morning's message, which comes from Reverend Sonia. I'm sure that the words she brings you will touch, inspire, and heal. Reverend Sonia. Thank you, Carol. Surprise! <laughs> good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living, not only for those of us who are here, but for those of us on the World Wide Web. It is my pleasure always to share the platform with the beloved Carol Charlton. Um, but before I go into my talk, I would like us, I'd just like to add my my um, words to know that having visited Reverend Michael, he is just demonstrating all the truth you could ever imagine. He is just getting better at a rapid rate, and I would like you to just join me in an affirmative prayer as he continues on this journey. There is one infinite power and presence. We call it God. And we know it is that which, having shaped and sculpted and fashioned in its very fine detail and uniqueness, Reverend Michael Record, it is that which is continuing to lift him in every aspect of his being, from the most subtle to the most obvious. His body, his mind, his spirit, his emotions, his affairs, all take on a greater leap of consciousness, a greater sense of the purity of its being than ever before, so that this experience becomes for him an even greater opportunity to move higher and higher into the realms of advanced thinking, of advanced being. We bless that body. We bless the unique and wonderful spirit of God working in and through him. And we bless the intelligence that knows how to do and how to be everything. I see him happy. I see him energetic. I see him strong. I see him joyous. I see him filled with love, as all the love we have in our hearts. Right here and right now, even as I speak, he feels it and is exalted. I give thanks and praise that it is so, and so it is. I talk this morning, the topic has changed many times, but the substance and the content is the same. And the topic is, everything is always working out for me, and that topic is a gift from Oprah Winfrey, who uses this as her affirmation. She calls it something else, but I call it her affirmation. She calls it her mantra. You know, I have a very interesting and exacting relationship with the universal principle we call God in that every time I am preparing to share from this platform, an experience comes to me that matches exactly the talk I wish to give. So I can safely say that when I share, I am speaking to myself as much as I am speaking to you all. My most recent adventure is not yet mature, so I will wait for a later time to share the details of it. Last night, however, I somewhat hesitantly agreed to attend the annual banquet of the Medical Association of Jamaica, which I go to every year. I went only after consulting my inner guide, as I had planned and preferred an early bedtime in preparation for church. Having done my consultation, I was confident that it was the right thing to go. Meeting with colleagues, many of whom I have not 
I've known for years but rarely see, is always a delightful occasion. It reminds one of many shared pleasant experiences and even some difficult ones around which we bonded and made lasting memories as we triumphed over them. When I decided to go, I had no idea that one of my favorite speakers, Sir Harry Beckles, would be the guest speaker. This was my confirmation that I had heard my guide right. I settled in for the night, and it was thrilling. Not only was I thrilled to hear him speak so eloquently, but he began to talk that his talk with a story which was an exact match for the talk that I had prepared. Later on that evening, one of the awardees made a statement which jumped out at me once again. In telling this story, his story, the doctor declared, in every difficulty is an opportunity. In every difficulty, is an opportunity. So, so true. Now in giving his talk, Dr. Beckles told us, he's, a, he's quite a historian, you know, so he told us about the colonial era in Jamaica and the Caribbean, and this was in the 1930s. He said the conditions in the, of the people in the Caribbean was so deplorable and appalling that there were disturbances throughout the entire thirties. The people, sometimes you get the idea that people just sat there and took it, right? It, did, it wasn't like that at all. For those who know history, people were in a constant struggle. And it reached a stage where it was definitely not a happy situation. There was, of course, violence and demonstrations, and enough terrifying for the people then and their conditions that the news went back to Britain. And it so concerned the monarch that the monarch sent out commission, called a commissioner, and sent out people to investigate what on earth could have caused these genteel people to be acting in this manner. Genteel people. This commission became known as the Moyne Commission and the report, the Moyne Report. As a result of the recommendations in the report, far-reaching changes were made to the social and economic conditions in all of the territories of the Caribbean, which resonate to this day. Many, many changes that are responsible for our health status and our living conditions, and even to some extent our economic conditions were made. And if you think that you don't like what's happening, no, I can promise you what was happening then defies all description. So, but two very important outcomes that are dear to my heart was the establishment of the medical school in Jamaica. And the plans were started immediately for a medical school because it was thought that education was the answer. And that the first medical association in the Western Hemisphere outside of Britain was also started in Jamaica, which to this day is going strong, and that's the one that I went to last night. In every difficulty is an opportunity. In every difficulty is an opportunity, if we care to see it. A period of extreme difficulty gave birth to institutions of lasting value. It is easy to look back on the dire conditions of the past and ignore the good that came despite of them. 
To face her difficult past is not always easy, not least of which is a concern that by focusing on opportunities that were grasped, we may be doing an injustice to the suffering that we or others may have had. There are several reasons too, among them, other reasons among them, fear lest it is too painful to confront because we have been told by our teaching and others that to do so is pointless and useless to live in the past and thus is right on all, and that is right on all counts. However, the past never leaves us. It appears in the way we view the present, the way we interpret the present in our emotional states. It is here as we spontaneously respond and act. I am taking a cue from actress Viola Davis. Those of you who are moviegoers will know her. And in addressing, she was giving an address. Um, I don't remember the university, but the address was a graduation address. And she summed it up for me. She said, who said everything about our past? had to be good, own it. Who said everything about our past had to be good, own it. And by that she is saying, yes, the past is the past. We're not asking you to celebrate it. We're asking you to admit to it. Own it as a part of your growth and your experience and look for the opportunities that may have derived from it, or even the unclaimed opportunities which can be derived from a second look and a deeper interpretation of the past. A difficult past that is not confronted with an enlightened mind can haunt us by coloring in a negative light anything and everything that we think about it. Persons or situations that remind us of the past, we would rather forget. Whether conscious or not, all past experiences are indelible in our mental programming, in our nervous system, and in time, if we allow it, even in our DNA. It does not matter what has happened in the past or what condition exists now. We must realize that we are using a power compared to which intelligence of the human race is nothing. And these are the words of Ernest Holmes, and I repeat them. He said, it does not matter what has happened in the past or what condition exists now. We must realize that we are using a power compared to which the united intelligence of the human race is nothing. So we bring the difficult past into our consciousness. We don't dig it up, we allow it. We focus only to the extent that we will set it right in our opinion or consciousness and thus create new and better experiences from an enlightened perspective. If we fail to do this, we would have missed an opportunity for spiritual growth. Oprah Winfrey, when addressing a graduating class, encouraged the graduates to confront their challenges with her personal mantra, and that is the title. Everything is always working out for me, simply for a woman so successful and so deeply entrenched in our spiritual journey. Everything is always working out for me. And when I confronted my unexpected challenge this week, it, this affirmation reached me instantly 
and it swept away any thoughts of escapism which I had chosen, the path I had chosen. I immediately felt empowered and continued. And I think I'm going to borrow this mantra. Um, would you mind saying it with me? Everything is always working out for me. Everything is always working out for me. Everything. It means everything, not some things. And always, forever. And working out, it is happening. It is happening because you have planted it in mind. And you don't have any responsibility except to plant it and leave it there. And that's why it feels so light. If your past or present has not been as you think it might be, if you have that nagging feeling that there is more that can come out of where you are or what you are doing, if there is any difficulty, any discomfort, any disappointment, any disquiet from memories of the past or challenges in the present, take them as a nudge. Take them as divine discontent. Recognize them for what they are, an opportunity. Don't struggle, don't ignore them, but don't ignore them. Ernest Holmes, I love this man, and I love everything that he says. He says again, it does not matter, I'm repeating it, what has happened in the past, what condition exists now, we must realize that we are using a power compared to which the united intelligence of the human race is nothing. Why? Because it is everything. It is all things. We are points at which it appears. And we can tap into that power which exists within us outside of our conscious awareness, sometimes, most of the time, but it is in eternity. We live both in the relative and in the absolute. We live in eternity by virtue of the fact that we are one with that infinite power, which is all things, and that we can draw on whenever we choose. In time, if we are continuously living from that awareness, we will be having spontaneous right thinking because that power will be thinking us, thinking through us. And the spontaneous right thinking becomes spontaneous right action, spontaneous right experience. So if we feel stuck and we say, really, we don't know which way to go, Catherine Ponder, who is this guru of prosperity, they call her, has a lovely statement that I love to stick into almost wherever, anywhere I talk. It says, Father, show me the divine plan for my life. Give me a definite lead now. Reveal to me my divine purpose under grace and in a perfect way. And then what happened? We go about our business and wait for the inspiration to come. Father, show me the divine plan for my life with me. Father, show me the divine plan for my life. Give me a definite lead now. Give me a definite lead now. Reveal to me my divine purpose. Reveal to me my divine purpose under grace and in a perfect way. Under grace and in a perfect way. And remember, remember, everything is always working out for me. And when you go about your business, out of the blue, you will hear with crystal clear clarity when you take your quiet time, which you must, because the quiet time refines that nervous system. Therefore, that is the vehicle of the mind, the servant of the mind. It refines it so that you can hear clearly the answer to that which you have affirmed. 
as a gift from Kashim Kondo. And Ernest Holmes says, meanwhile, if you're not seeing the thing yet, he says, you should be kind to yourself. Remember that there is no sin but a mistake, he says, and no punishment but a consequence. We must free our minds from self-condemnation. And by the same token, we should not judge or condemn others who are courageously striving to overcome their personal difficulties. The 2019 graduating class of a black Ivy League college recently had an experience of a lifetime. Those of you who are Facebook people will have read it, but for the rest of you who are not, I will tell you about it. All of the students were carrying student loans. They would take years to repay. Obama just repaired his, his uh, repaid his just in time to become president. The guest speaker was a billionaire who after giving his encouraging speech promised to the astonishment of the graduates to pay off all of their student loans. All of it, and it can be plenty. All that is except one young man who had withdrawn from the course two years before graduating because he did not want to saddle his family with the burden, that is his words, of repaying the student loans. This young man who demonstrated that he was responsible, considerate, did not graduate with his cohort, but was left to repay his loan by his own efforts and defer his studies. While his classmates graduated debt free, we do not judge, we merely observe. Consider for a moment where was his mind, which would you have been? We do not have to struggle to find our place in the universe, Ernest Holmes says. In the sight of the Almighty, which is in the sight of our own spiritual nature, we are of it no matter where we are. So if we find ourselves in a position where we have a task or a goal that we have set, and we find ourselves challenging where it will come from. We need to remind ourselves that there is no need to struggle. In the sight of the Almighty, which is a sight of our own spiritual nature, we are it no matter where we are or what we are doing. An early New Thought luminary, Annie Besant, says it this way, thought power can only be increased by steady and persistent exercise of it. As literally and as truly as muscular development depends on the exercise of the muscles we already possess, so does mental development depend on exercise of the mind already ours. Remember, everything is always working out for me. So we have to practice, we have to practice. Every one of us is on a learning curve, my words. None of us is immune to challenges or the need for growth. We are here to practice how to better express and experience the divine, that is God. If we decide to think of ourselves as where God shows up, just a simple intention becomes a seed which will germinate and enlarge this experience of God that we are reaching for. How easy it is to study the principles of scientific prayer and yet soon forget that we are dealing with a principle which responds to us by imaging back to us exactly as we believe and it does so unconditionally. There is no need for pleading or bargaining there's no force that can alter how the law works. Ernest Holmes again, healing is not creating a perfect idea. 
it is revealing an idea which is already perfect. So if we are revealing it, then we do not have to manipulate even our minds to make anything happen. We need to be aware that the perfection exists and allow the law of mind to gradually, ever so gradually or immediately demonstrate in our consciousness that we believe this. It takes practice and it takes determination. It takes personal commitment and definite intention and a desire to be spiritually independent. But it does not take force or coercion. I can only say to you, belief ultimately is what makes all the difference. We can believe something to be true without having proven it. But when we have put that, what we believe into practice and have it work for us, then we know and we know and we demonstrate and we see the proof, the greatest proof is results. And this is why it is important for us to demonstrate for ourselves by treatment, our own treatment. And you have heard that we will be setting out on an effort to ensure that everybody knows scientific prayer. Turn within, therefore, and seek advice at the source of all wisdom. In stillness, seek and find the wisdom of the greater good. Attend classes to strengthen your knowledge of the nature of God. Learn by experience, by feeling the presence of God. In stillness and in solitude, enter into the silence of the inner chamber and listen. Practice to identify the voice of the infinite not by might nor by power, but by thy word. Walk the labyrinth, learn to meditate, come participate in prayer power. Practice will awaken your intuition and insulate yourself from the inner chatter of indisciplined thoughts. Attend group meditation. Finally, that is once you have learned to meditate, finally, I love this statement by Emmett Fox from his book of daily readings. There is a mystic power that is able to transform your life so thoroughly, so radically, so completely, that when the process is complete, your own friends would hardly recognize you. And in fact, you could scarcely recognize yourself. <laughs> We are told that everything we could ever want or need is held in escrow until the deed had been transferred. We must by need to do, we need to do the legal work, work with the law, and then claim it. Everything is always working out for us. Say it together. Everything is always working out for us. Namaste.